really talking about any of my own work at all. I'm <laughs> complaining. This already, is good. <laughs> I'm complaining about not even other work, but how other work has been presented to people. Uh, so, basically, I'm going to go over one form of irresponsible communication of science com research. Uh, talk a bit about what I think are the incentives causing people to communicate in this way, and then talk about some potential solutions for making this less of a problem. Alright, a good analogy for getting into what I'm going to talk about uh, was put across on John Oliver last year or the year before, where he talked about how scientific studies are often presented wrongly, and I mean, this is sort of from medical research, but studies will be put forward like, oh, this or that thing causes cancer, or cures cancer, or reduces cancer, or something, and they don't say in the report, oh yeah, by the way, this was a study on like 12 mice, um, which is important. It's still good to do research on mice. They do it because research on mice can tell you a lot about like biology and how drugs might work. But it's different from actually testing it on people, right? You're going to interpret something very differently if you know that it was a study on mice compared to if you think that, oh, maybe they actually did this on people and it worked, right? And there are ways in which oftentimes the communication research or really any form of social science research that gets done can be similar to trials on mice in that while it's very useful in building towards understanding how stuff works on its own, you can't be sure that the findings in that study generalize to the broader stuff in the real world that people are really interested in. So for example, studies that are done in the lab or online, those kind of surveys as opposed to studies tested like in the real world where people don't know they're actually in a research study. There's one difference where studies don't necessarily tell you about real world behavior. Uh, Non-causal versus causal evidence, so basically correlations versus testing things in experiments or finding some other way to get stronger evidence of what causes what as opposed to what's just related to what. Single messages versus categories of message, basically people will talk about like, oh, well we'll look at it in a second, but scary messages about climate change are bad, when in fact what they tested was one particular scary message about climate change, not the whole category of like scary messages in general. Uh, right. And then also, what is the sample that you looked at? What can you conclude about them as opposed to the overall population of people that you want to be making conclusions about? And there's more stuff as well, but there's somewhat highlight. To illustrate how these played in a particular example. So there was a study published in 2010 about that was one of the scary messages are bad studies. Uh, dire messages, what they called dire messages versus a hopeful message on climate change. Uh, and in the messages themselves, the first uh, 500 words was the same across the different conditions. It was information on severity, causes, and impacts of climate change, so basically bad stuff about climate change. And then what was different across the different messages was the last few words, the last 180 words. It was either dire or positive. And uh, the dire condition led to people being more skeptical that climate change was a big deal. Okay, so that's the result, and this was presented as scary messages are bad. But when you look at the actual dire message condition, it's a bit different to what you might expect of like when you just hear dire messages, messages about bad effects, right? Unfortunately, according to many members, so this is the actual message wording, the part at the end, which is, which is different from the other message condition. According to many members of the IPCC, global warming is now at a point where it may be irreversible. We fear it may be too late. We have reached the point of no return. Uh, all the numbers and computer models point in the same dire and devastating direction. 
No one knows for sure how horrible it will get, but we should prepare for worldwide chaos and destruction. Uh, Amanda Liu, member of the IPCC and author of the recent book, Why Science Can't Help, uh, the first said, the first domino has been pushed and now the chain reaction is underway and building momentum. Global warming is going to change everything for the worst. It is too big of a problem for science to grapple with. Uh, right. Every day we find something new that is causing more and more destruction. So basically like the end of a disaster movie, not even the like warning from the scientists that like maybe stuff is happening, but like the world is actually being destroyed and there is absolutely nothing that science can do. That's pretty extreme, right? Like, when you think of a dire message on climate change, there's plenty of stuff that you could talk about that's like real bad that is not, oh my god, we're going to be all dead in three years or whatever, which is kind of what this feels like. But the way that this study was covered, so in uh, the Washington Post, gloom and doom on climate can backfire, and new study says, and Julia Alperin was the reporter, and one quote from the author, one of the authors in the study, the scarier the message, the more people who are committed to viewing the world as fundamentally stable and fair are motivated to deny it. You know, the scarier the message, the worse your outcomes are going to be. Another one in New York Times, dire descriptions of global warming and isolation can cause people to recoil from acceptance of the problem. And so that was in 2010 as well when the study was published. More, slightly more recently, in 2014, uh, these two chaps wrote an op-ed saying global warming is basically global warming is bad. It was in response to that TV series that came out, if you heard of it, uh, The Years of Living Dangerously, yeah. with Arnold Schwarzenegger and uh, John Cheadle and whatnot talking about climate change is bad. Basically, they were saying, oh yeah, this big TV series on climate change, before it comes out, this sucks and it's going to have like no effect or negative effects. And they cited uh, more than a decade's worth of research suggests that fear-based appeals about climate change inspired denial, fatalism, and polarization. And the specific one referring to this study in a controlled lab experiment published in Psychological Science in 2010, researchers were able to use dire messages about global warming to increase skepticism about the problem. So, well, broadly I would argue that's a pretty one-sided view of the overall research that has been done on this. Um, but generally speaking, across the different media coverage, so Julia Alperin did mention in her article that the study sample was not representative, so that was really good, but did not mention, like she was the best, but even she didn't mention, you know, lab versus field, like not being tested on real world behavior makes a difference to what people will actually do. Again, two messages that they had, all the headlines, all the discussion was about scary messages. Anything that's bad, anything that talks about the bad stuff of climate change, not the specific crazy one that they had there, but like broadly scary messages. Uh, they didn't talk, like, I don't, I'm guessing because it doesn't appear in the main article that was published, it's in the supplementary materials, but I'm guessing that most of the people reporting on it didn't read what the message actually said. Um, and didn't certainly report on how like intense and over the top that message was. Also, remember that the first 600 words or so of the message that were the same across both of them did actually have a lot of stuff about the bad impacts of climate change. And the like positive message, the one that they framed as being good and this is what you should do, also included a bunch of stuff about the bad impacts of climate change. As a result of this coverage, you know, I haven't seen any systematic studies on the impacts on science communicators' beliefs or behavior or anything, but I did hear from several specific people who were, you know, after hearing about stuff like this, were worried that, oh, should we just not talk about the bad stuff, the bad impacts, is that bad? Like, is that going to make people less likely to want to do stuff? Um, 
despite the fact that you could very well need to have that kind of stuff in effective communication about climate change. Like the study in itself didn't disprove the possibility that this could either like, well, maybe it doesn't do anything in particular, but at least it doesn't have negative effects, or maybe it has really good effects. They haven't ruled that out. But by covering this and having this idea that scary stuff is bad out there, if people, assuming that talking about scary stuff is effective, but advocacy groups shied away from using it, coverage of this research may have made the push to take action on climate change actually less effective, right? And because of this, would it actually have potentially been better not to cover this research? There's nothing wrong with doing this kind of research for sure, but like, would it be better if this hadn't been broadcast so widely so that it scared people? All right, a couple more examples, more recent things where stuff has been exaggerated. Uh, so one that was uh, put out last month uh, was covered as Trump may owe his 2016 victory to fake news, new study suggests. So this was a piece in the website, The Conversation, uh, by the authors themselves, summarizing their study, uh, and note this key point, oh, his victory. Not just it was one factor, but like this was the decisive factor, right? Quotes from their, not the article itself, but their web blog thing about the article. Our study concludes that fake news most likely did have a substantial impact on the voting decisions of a strategically important set of voters. Though our evidence does not prove that belief in fake news caused these former Obama voters to defect from the Democratic candidate in 2016, our study results suggest that it is highly likely that the pollution of our discourse by fake news was sufficient to influence the outcome of what was a very close election. I've highlighted those words because the words in red, they're saying like, yeah, it caused it. Like, elsewhere, they're like, well, it didn't technically prove that it caused it, but it caused it, right? Like, <laughs> that's kind of what they're doing. Um, okay, oh, I wanted the bullets up here individually, whatever. Um, the actual details of the study, so what they did, they had a sample of 585 people. Uh, it's a sample done by YouGov, uh, so like, really excellent sample in this case. Uh, and it was a, from a bigger sample, but they've reduced it down to just the people that voted for Obama in 2012. So had voted for Obama the previous presidential election, looking just at them. It was done in December 2016, so just after the presidential election, where Trump got elected. And they asked them, like, to say, is this true or is this false? Hillary Clinton is in very poor health due to serious illness. During her time as Secretary of State, Hillary approved weapon sales to ISIS, and Pope Francis endorsed Trump before the election. All of those were false, uh, and what they did, they looked at, okay, your likelihood of saying that those were true, how is that related to who you voted for? And the people who said more of them were true were more likely to vote for Trump. Suggesting, you know, and the interpretation that they had is like, okay, like, these people who said that must have been exposed to these stories, so this looks like exposure to these stories made people want to vote for Trump. That's the interpretation. But they also say, in, to their credit, uh, in the piece, it is also possible that someone who chose not to vote for Clinton might endorse these false statements after the fact in order to rationalize their voting decision. Yeah. <laughs> they, I mean, maybe to rationalize their decision, but maybe also just like, well, you know, it's good statements about, uh, a good statement about Trump and bad statements about Hillary. If you voted for Trump, you're more likely to say that bad stuff about Hillary is true and good stuff about Trump is true, right? There's lots of reasons it, that could have been the reason. And as well as that, they're talking about, they're not talking about 
believing that and what effect believing that has, their argument that they're making is that seeing the fake news articles, getting exposed to fake news, that's what causes you to vote or cause people to vote for Trump, right? Or cause, more specifically, cause the people who previously voted for Obama to swing to Trump. That's their argument, but they have no measure of what people were exposed to. They didn't even ask, like, I guess they wouldn't ask, did you watch a whole bunch of fake news or something, but if you really wanted to test, does exposure to fake news shift your vote, you need to get some measurement of exposure to fake news. Or, you, I mean, ideally you do some kind of experiment, but experiments provide the strongest causal evidence, but nevertheless. Uh, okay, so that was another example where it's spun as uh, fake news swung the election without going into the details or like as heavily explaining the kind of stuff that we just talked about. A further example, so slightly older uh, research, but that came up uh, yesterday in a Twitter discussion that uh, myself and Dominique were involved in. Uh, so, gaining, it was published in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, gaining trust as well as respect in communicating to motivated audiences about science topics. Uh, this, so, the overall topic of the articles uh, is more broad than what I'm going to talk about, but part of what was covered in the response to this, if the thing moves on, is cold but competent, a problem in science communication, or why don't Americans trust scientists? The thing that came out of it was like, oh, Americans see scientists as like, you know, they're smart, they know what they're doing, but they're sort of cold and not really trustworthy, right? They're, they know what they're doing, they're kind of like the like Spock-like, but uh, yeah. And this is the graph or the analysis that they based that statement on, the authors, and what it shows along the x-axis you have people's ratings of how competent people in different professions are, so you have all like garbage collectors, laborers, police officers, whatever. Competence along the bottom, and then warmth at the top. So, you know, professions that are warmer up higher, professions that are colder down lower. And you see, you know, the, the warmest is like teacher and nurse, and is that the laser button? There we go. And scientist is right there. So, I mean, Clearly, scientists aren't at the top of the pack, but note that the presentation of the study was all about scientists are not trusted, scientists are cold, right? This is my guess of the average. I don't uh, think they report, I'm not sure, but I don't think they report what the average was, but that's just my guess of roughly where the average level was, would be, looking at how everything's laid out there. And uh, assuming my guess is right, uh, scientists are actually above average on board, right? Even if that's not where the actual average is, even if it's a bit higher, scientists are still like decently above like a large mass of all the occupations that they looked at, right? Suggesting like, you know, okay, they're not the warmest, but they're above average. They're doing pretty good compared to other people. Uh, other problems that weren't discussed a lot in the coverage of the study, so it was only 116 people. You know, there's nothing wrong with doing studies on 100 or so people, but you've got to be appropriately co conservative about what conclusions you want to draw. And also, if you're familiar with Amazon Mechanical Tech, it's a place you get survey participants. I use it, I think it's awesome, but it is not a representative sample of the U.S. public. There's way more liberals, there's way more like slightly less wealthy people because the people that want to go and get paid to get surveys are often earning less money. There's all these ways in which it's different to the US average. But in the press release, it's presented as scientists seen as competent but not trusted, so not trusted, by Americans. Not 
116 people from Mechanical Turk, but Americans, right? <laughs> Uh, there was a great, I mean, part of my uh, skepticism of all this and kind of my annoyance at uh, how it was covered was because of this great investigation by Paige Brown Jarrow. I don't know if I'm pronouncing her name right, but she's a science blogger and, well, I think she was just blogging then, but she's now like a professional science communicator. Uh, scientists, we do trust you, even if you could be a little warmer. And she looked into this and found out that, you know, okay, the PR office wrote the press release, but both of the study authors approved it and were okay with it. And when she asked one of the authors, Susan Fisk, do you feel like this was an appropriate like description of your study, scientists seen as not trusted by Americans, uh, she said, I approved the press release. That being said, I can see that people could interpret our data from different perspectives. Mostly the issue is trustworthy compared to what standard. We were comparing trust compared to competence. Scientists are viewed as higher on competence than trustworthiness. And then Gerard adds at the end, I think that should have been the headline there. Scientists are viewed as higher on competence than trustworthiness. Not that scientists aren't trusted. So, I totally agree with that. Like, and it's interesting that, you know, she didn't, she wasn't prepared to say, like, no, that's not accurate, but, I don't know, it wasn't. Uh, and, okay, so that was a few years ago, but first, was it a presentation, the uh, colloquium on the science of science communication, the most recent one at the end of last year, said all the stuff again. Scientists are cold, scientists aren't trusted, uh, not based on new data, based on the same previous data that they had. All right, so they laid out all the irresponsible communication. Why does this keep happening? Why, why aren't people fixing this kind of issue? Uh, one interesting study that came out a couple of years ago looked at, like, uh, and specifically health, uh, research found that uh, a lot of the like misleading claims that were in the press reports were it's not that the journalists had misinterpreted the research and had like put in the extra like exaggerated stuff themselves it was in the press releases from the university so that is one big factor but I think there's you know it, blame shouldn't just go to one thing I think there's a few factors at play here uh, generally speaking, a lot of people have incentives, not just journalists, that reward like more dramatic claims than the research actually supports. Yes, journalists, university PR and so on, uh, want more dramatic stories, want their university to look good, want people to read their articles, etc. But also, people who are looking for, you know, even when stuff isn't going through the media, but is just being sprayed directly to communication practitioners, people want advice, you know, communication is hard, people want to be given, like, clear, useful advice on what to do, and it's, it's natural, and in some ways people should hope to be given, like, nice, clear stories by the researchers who are looking into this kind of thing, right? But there's a downside in that the practitioners themselves most of the time don't have the time or background to fully check out all of these kind of methodological details of the studies to see if like, okay, are people hyping this or is this accurate, right? So, they will, you know, they trust us, they trust us researchers, which is good, but they're not always going to uh, have that trust justified. Researchers themselves as well, want to get attention. They want their research to stand out from everybody else. Uh, and this all leads together to not only are people putting out uh, misleading claims, they're supplying this kind of responsible communication, but people want to be given more certainty than is really there, right? This supply and demand. And in practice for researchers, 
it could potentially lead to the problem where you might actually be punished effectively for making accurate claims about your research. If you're honest about what your study says, if you say like, well, I wouldn't make any strong recommendations based on my data, it's too early, we don't know. You're going to get less attention and less prestige, potentially, than someone who is just putting out exaggerations and hype uh, if those aren't punished later, right? Okay, how do we deal with this? What are things that we can do to improve this kind of situation? One solution that could potentially work is something that I call maximum strictness. So adopt a policy, basically, of never discussing mouse model results, in other words, studies that are done on small populations that you can't generalize, that don't get strong causal evidence. If there's anything that doesn't let you be confident that this would apply broadly, don't talk about it. Just say, like, it's too early, we don't want to talk about that yet. Uh, when you only publicize, this is a sort of an extreme version of it, but when people have done high quality experiments in the field and have done a few of them and have done what's known as a meta-analysis, so averaging a bunch of studies to check like over a selection of them, does this style of messaging still work or does this effect still happen? Only talk about that stuff when it's like really solid, really set. Otherwise say we have no idea. One problem with this approach is that almost no one is going to do it. Like it's too intense. Uh, and even if you did get some people to adopt this kind of thing, uh, people who are more misleading are just going to keep putting their stuff out there anyway, right? Like you'll get a few more people being more strict, but there's still going to be misle misleading claims put out by the people who don't want to adopt this standard. Another solution is to keep putting out reports and press releases and getting coverage for like more preliminary studies, but be better at adding caveats. Uh, this is uh, the phrase best practices is best guesses applies here, so basically I stole it from Dan Kahan. Uh, some kind of, any kind of study, no matter how good it is, doesn't guarantee, you know, if you're testing a message, you're never going to guarantee that it's going to be effective the next time you want to use it. You're never going to guarantee that what you found in one case is going to hold in the next one. All we can do is use the research we have to make the best possible guess, to make better guesses about what's going to work in the future. Uh, so even correlational evidence, like you've, if you're clear about the preliminary nature of it, you've still got a better guess of what's going to be effective than you would have without that research, right? Uh, the problem with this kind of solution of just being clear about the caveats is that basically bothering to communicate at all about some new study carries the implication that like you really can tell some pretty good stuff from this study, right? So for example, uh, if you put out the message like, oh, well, it's just a correlational study, you know, fake belief in fake news stories is correlated with supporting Trump, like, but be careful about how you interpret it. The implicit message behind that, if that's what you're saying publicly, is like, but it probably works, right? Like, people are going to take away that message to some extent, even if you tell them not to. And that's kind of what they did in that study where they say, like, well, we can't prove it's causal evidence, but it sort of is. It strongly suggests that it is. It pretty much is. Uh, that's the message that people are going to get. Another solution is to attack people. <laughs> so be super aggressive when a crappy study comes out. Or, no, not a crappy study, but when an exaggerated description of what I should add that all the work that I've discussed is good work. There's nothing wrong with the work itself, it's in how it was presented. And when you attack these claims about it, maybe that'll work. 
uh, a quote about this kind of practice from one of the prominent people who likes to attack studies, to not slam people for low quality work is implicitly to hurt all the serious researchers out there. I show my respect for researchers who show care by not going easy on those who don't. The idea that like you're, you know, you're actually helping the people who are not so clear by not attacking them. And that's Andrew Gelman, you can read his blog post about that. Uh, well, just Google Gelman and you'll be able to find him attacking stuff. Uh, the advantage of this, one thing that I think is really good, is that it doesn't require the people themselves, like the people who are putting out misleading claims, to raise their standards. Like, there's always going to be some people who don't want to up their standards of reporting, who still want to exaggerate things. And if you can get, give you know, your audience a clearer understanding of, well, you, shouldn't, you should be more skeptical of this research, uh, by attacking overhyped claims, that's good. That's one other thing that you can do. The downside of this is that sometimes the attacks are maybe going to be unjustified, are going to get nasty, and aren't are going to be more about just people fighting as opposed to uh, actually making it clear to people what's wrong with studies. Another solution is set up full organizations whose entire job it is to go through and, you know, well, the practitioners and maybe journalists can't, they don't have the time or the background to check out stuff themselves, well, why not get someone and make it their job to do that for people, right? Either have a fact check kind of a system where when claims get put out there and start to get attention, people respond by fact checking it and putting up a report like PolitiFact and so on. Or uh, another form of organization, uh, I don't know if you've heard of the Cochrane Collaboration or in education research, the What Works Clearinghouse. But these are groups who don't, they don't like do rapid response to particular claims, but they'll look through a bunch of studies and say like, okay, this research area or this topic, like we rate the evidence as, you know, it's still very tentative, not too many high quality studies have been done, you know, some in the initial research suggests what might be working, but we should wait for more conclusive results. Or, you know, oh, this one topic, this finding that climate, scary climate messages are bad, oh, they, they actually have done a lot of research on this, it's very high quality, like, you can be confident that this is bad to do that. That isn't where the research actually is, but that this organization would be able to put out that kind of report to help people better judge, like, how confident can we be about these results. The uh, pro for this is that that organization would have both the, like, you know, the goal and the resources to actually fully vet stuff, do it objectively, do it well and everything. Uh, the downside is that it costs money to make entire organizations. Right. Someone would, you know, people fund PolitiFact, people fund these other groups, you would need to get a bunch of money to make this happen. You wouldn't just need to tell people, let's improve our, what we all do as researchers, you would need to get a whole bunch of funding. So, to sum up all of this basically, I think all four of those solutions, there's uses for each of them in certain cases. And basically, we don't know which of them is going to work. People are still trying out the best ways to respond to this kind of overhype problem. Uh, but this is a problem that is going to keep going on. We've seen examples from across several years of communication research. All the incentives at the moment, a lot of them are still pointing in the direction of, hey guys, you should overhype your studies and get attention, right? And until those incentives change significantly, the nature of the reporting on the study isn't going to change much. Finally, if you want further discussion of this, there's a good podcast on social science run by some researchers. Uh, they're all social psychologists, but 
it, basically everything that they're discussing is just as relevant to calm research. Uh, so if you're interested in further discussion of this, their latest episode is actually all about hype of studies. So if you're interested in that, uh, check that. All right, time for questions. 